Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 90 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I interview Craig Martell, who's a full-time author who currently lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. He grew up in Iowa, joined the Marine Corps, and got to see the best and worst that the world has to offer. He then earned a law degree, but no matter where he went, he always had a book with him. At the age of 52, Craig retired from his other work and focused on full-time writing where he makes a really good living. His passion for writing has resulted in numerous best-selling titles in the following genres, space opera, military sci-fi, space marine, colonization, and genetic engineering. Craig is well-known in the indie author community as the head of 20 Books to 50K conferences, and in this episode we talk about all that, as well as his latest non-fiction book, Successful Indie Author Strategies. Now, I received some comments from recent episodes, and Michelle Nori commented on episode 88, which was called Indie Publishing, Not Self-Publishing, with David Wind, and Michelle said, Hi Mark, great podcast. I actually learned some stuff. LOL. I honestly have to say that I was biased against self-publishing. Sort of an anyone can publish their crap and the good stuff will get lost in the sea of icky writing. I'll have to look out for this book as it seems to give great advice on how to get recognized. Once again, great job. Thanks for that comment, Michelle. I'm like you. I had the same approach to self-publishing. When I first started as a bookseller, I would have self-published authors bring these really crappy books into my store, and nine times out of ten, they were really, really crappy. So I started off with a a bias against self-published titles. Of course, I got into it in 2004 and, and learned that, just like in traditional publishing, there's some crap that should never be published. I mean, really, do we really need to read the Snooky bio? In any case, personal choice. I'm sure someone loves, I'm sure lots of people love the Snooky bio. But again, it's about taste and it's about quality, and we get into some of that with Craig. But um, I changed my mind, obviously, uh, about what indie publishing can be. So thanks, Michelle, for that comment. And Tracy Ariel also commented on the same episode, and Tracy said... Thanks to Mark and David for a wide-ranging discussion about the huge changes writers have faced in the last two decades. It's wonderful to have both of you as knowledgeable guides to outline potential pitfalls and pleasures as I begin experimenting with independent publishing. Thanks for that comment, Tracy. I love the fact that you're saying that you're experimenting uh, with independent publishing, and I think experimenting is key. You've got to try things. You've got to try different things. I'm glad you're aware of the potential uh, pitfalls, which is great, but it's always important that because this is indie publishing, you're independently minded, and you know your goals, and you know your audience, and you know your writing, and experimenting within that is, is awesome. I wish you all the best of luck, and perhaps you'll be sharing some of those experiments with us in a future episode. So thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Tracy, for your comments on episode 88. Because you commented on episode 88, you're now in the random draw, along with Linda Lee, for the chance to win a signed copy of David's book, The Indie Writer's Handbook. So that's right, if I can do my math correctly, there's three of you, so that's like a 33.33333 or something like that uh, chance that you each have of winning one of those copies. Now, I'm recording this on Thursday, August 15th, and there is about 24 hours or so for folks to leave a comment on episode 88 for a chance to win David's book. All you have to do is leave a comment on episode 88 over at starkreflections.ca. Only comments entered before midnight Eastern Standard Time, Friday, August 16th. They're going to be eligible for a chance to win, and the winner will be announced in next week's episode, episode 91. 
Now, if you're listening to this episode, Too Late to Win, don't worry. There's always more opportunities to win and more options. For example, stay tuned. There will be a chance to win one of a few copies of Craig Martell's new book just by commenting on this episode, episode 90. Details will be coming up after our interview. Speaking of winners, I know a really cool group of winners. Anyone sponsoring this podcast via Patreon are all winners. Oh, come on. All you listeners are winners, too. But the patrons who uh, support this podcast over on patreon.com slash starkreflections are entered automatically for a chance to win David's book just by being a patron. No comment required. Sounds like an old Phil Collins album. No jacket required. No jacket required. But maybe I should do an album called No Comment Required. Nah, if you've heard me sing in previous episodes, nobody wants that. But people might want a chance to win a second signed copy of David's book. So all patrons uh, will be entered into um, a draw for that second copy of uh, David's book. And um, and one of them will be the lucky winner and will be announced in next episode as well. And this is a shout out to all patrons of the show with a thanks for your support. For $1, $3, or $5 a month, you too can be a patron of the show and get access to an additional chance to win books like David's, plus additional patron-only content, which includes a special patron-only series of podcasts. I just released the latest in the Stark Reflections on other podcast episodes, and in this one, I talk about my own reflections about the recent episode 85 of the Career Author Podcast, which is hosted by Jay Thorne and Zach Bahannon. It's over at thecareerauthor.com. Now, both have been on two previous episodes of this podcast, and I'll have links to those episodes in the show notes. But in their episode 85, they talk about author pseudonyms, and I share a bit about the reasons and origin of my own Mark Leslie pseudonym, as well as why my friend Stephen King, no, not the Stephen King you might already be familiar with, a much cooler Stephen King, well, okay, the, 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 the Stephen King you're familiar with is really, really cool, but so is my buddy from the Toronto area. But why Stephen King, who's also a writer and a friend of mine, chose to still use, use his own name for his books, even though there was that potential conflict related to the, the larger Stephen King that we're probably all familiar with. And again, check your feed. If uh, you are a patron, that should be coming to your feed uh, probably well before this episode gets to the air. Now, in terms of a quick personal update, I just got back from When Words Collide in Calgary, Alberta, which is an amazing conference, well over 800 attendees, and I did a few presentations there, including one called Leveraging Your IP and Maximizing Your Income as a Hybrid Author. I sat on a panel called Chapbook as Marketing Tool, and uh, I did a series of Pick Mark's Brain one-on-one sessions on the Sunday, which were absolutely phenomenal. I got a chance to sit down and really get to know some amazing writers uh, and, uh, and, and work through some stuff with them. It was a sort of 20 minutes each, so I was able to sit down with three different authors every hour. Now, I also did at this conference for the first time ever a 45-minute talk based on my book, The Seven Ps of Publishing Success, and I did it to a packed standing only uh, room which was absolutely amazing great crowd there uh, it was very well received uh, had some great questions as well because I actually did it in a way that I actually left 10 minutes at the end for questions rather than trying to jam so much information in and rush through it uh, and then not have time for questions and I received numerous compliments about the content and even the style of that talk so thanks to everyone who was there you were an amazing audience and asked some fantastic questions. Now, I also heard from another number of attendees at When Words Collide that they listen to this podcast and that they enjoy the content and, and find value in it. And that's that's so awesome. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to let me know that you're listening to the podcast. It uh, is such an amazing thing. And it always brightens my day to know that even when I'm not there in person at a conference and getting a chance to network and interact with authors, that um, from from afar, from remote, that some of my reflections are resonating with other authors and listeners. And that truly does make my day. So thank you guys for saying hi and letting me know that you listen to the podcast. Well, that's it for the introductory matter to this podcast. Let's get right into this conversation with me and Craig Martell. Hey, Craig, thanks so much for hanging out with me here today. Great to be on the show, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, for those people who don't know who Craig Martell is and why it is so critical that uh, somebody like you's written the books, you know, successfully successful indie author release strategies and become a successful indie author. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Now, I want to prompt you by using uh, sort of a quote or, or a phrase that I've heard uh, in referring to who you are, that you're a blue collar author with a law degree. Uh, is that a good way to prompt who Craig Martell is? I, I think so, because uh, yes, I have the law degree, but I believe in uh, you work as hard as you have to work and get your hands dirty. And uh, somebody asked me a couple of days ago, how hard do you work? How many hours do you put in? And I told him, well, 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week. And I've been doing that for, uh, geez, uh, going on four years now. Okay. It, it it helps make the difference. Oh, nobody can write a book a month. Well, if you're putting in uh, 300 hours a month, well, guess what? You can and and fairly easily. But then how do you make sure it's a professional book? And I know you uh, said earlier you wanted to talk about uh, the logistics of being a an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get into that, I do want to come back to your background because you do have an extensive background in writing and publishing. Can we, can we go back maybe to the early days of, of your passion for reading and writing and, and how that evolved into what, what you've, this amazing empire that you've created? Oh, well, thank you. I, I grew up in, uh, I grew up not far from Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, a child of the sixties. And uh, in the seventies, I was in my teens and guess what came out of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin in 1974? And that was Dungeons and Dragons. I was real close to the epicenter. And so needless to say, I was uh, introduced to it early. 1976, I think my brother brought me my first copy. Uh, 1978, I met Jim Ward and Metamorphosis Alpha. And so those games were uh, the, at the core of my being. I read all of the Robert E. Howard. I read uh, Anne McCaffrey. I read everything I could get, science fiction, fantasy at the time, Tolkien, you name it. And through my whole adult life, I was reading. I was gaming. I was uh, uh, one with the games, you know, the imagination wow. as a game master. Right. And then finally, when I retired from my second gig, that's when it's like, hey, I have all these stories in my mind. It's about time to, to put them down on paper. Wow. Wow. So when you watch something like Stranger Things, you're going, yeah, I'm, I was one of those kids in the basement, you know, with the, <laughs> playing Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. Is that the that the kind of uh, environment you were in? Oh, it, it is because uh, we would drive over to Lake Geneva. I would go to the dungeon, the original game store, wow. and pick up any miniatures and secondary uh, 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 used miniatures that they had. I'd bring them home and I had a pool table that I had set up as a dungeon. I covered all the things and used uh, one by twos. Really, really uh, great. I, I was in the newspaper and I, I'll be damned if I can find a copy of that article. I was a headliner in the newspaper wow. of, hey, playing Dungeons and Dragons with picture of me and my friends playing in my basement. N needless to say, it was at that time, it was guaranteed uh, that, that you would never uh, uh, meet women that way. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I was, but I was a headliner in the newspaper. There you go. <laughs> how did how did that uh, involvement in sort of epic fantasy and creating things like as a dungeon master or as a player, how did that inform your early writing or did it inform your early writing? It did because it's always about the story. And as I as an adult, I went through uh, uh, 20 years in the Marine Corps, so combat, those elements, and then I became a lawyer and then I was a business consultant. So as a business consultant, you have the product, uh, the product chain, uh, the supply chain management, and those things that you need to be successful. So I looked at my old uh, uh, dungeons, and there was no rhyme or reason, just random monsters. Well, everything has to have a purpose. You have your henchmen, you have your, your, your leader. How do you feed them? How do you do this? So I, I looked at that, and that evolved. It's like, oh, it's the whole story. So why does anyone, there's a dungeon, why don't we just seal the seal the entrances and let's go party. <laughs> and so many people, I want to go, well, why do you have to go down a dungeon? And that's the storytelling. And it, uh, it, it becomes second nature when you build your modules, your scenarios that way. Okay, cool. And, and you mentioned Marine Corps and I want to get into that because one of the quotes from your book on release strategies talk to, uh, talks about amateurs talk tactics and uh, professionals talk logistics. So obviously, your experience in the Marine Corps has informed your uh, author business as well? It, it is. Uh, a lot of people like, hey, I can write 100,000 words in, in two weeks. And I know people like that. But 
can you publish them? So now you need to have editors. You need to have covers for all those books. You had to have editing time. You have to have proofreader time. So that's what the, that's where the logistics of, yes, you can write the words, but can you get, bring the words to a product that is uh, competitive on the market, that the readers will embrace and then buy the next book? So that's a, that's a logistics train. So yes, the artist, so that's that you're talking tactics. Hey, I'm going to write four books this month, but I'm only going to publish one. And, and things like that. I think Amanda Lee has a great process for the way she works in that uh, as she writes her book now. And generally, it'll be six months to uh, longer before it actually gets published because she's she has that that uh, chain, that product development cycle is uh, intentional, a lot of intentionality behind it. Okay. Wow. Now, f- there are there are folks who know you and who know your background and know what you've done. And, 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 and it's been relatively recent, probably in the last three or four years, that it's really taken off in an amazing way. But let's go back to your beginning uh, into the writing and publishing sphere. How did, how did that first happen? And, and you know, so we can kind of get us to present day. When I retired from my second job, I thought, hey, I'm going to do stuff around my house. I live in Alaska. I have a couple acres and uh, just cleaning up around the yard and stuff. So I cleared a lot of brush and I was going to start a fire and I actually started myself on fire and uh, stop, drop and roll. And uh, I, I did that. I had, a, I had a second degree burn on uh, most of my leg because of uh, uh, all the gasoline. Yes, never use gasoline for a fire. So. So I decided that it wasn't safe for me to do that kind of stuff. And I wanted, and I said, I, I always want to write a book. So let me write a book. Whenever I commit to doing something, I don't do it half-assed. So I, uh, 61 days, and, I, and of course, being a business professional, I tracked everything. So 61 <laughs> days later, I had a 100,000 word novel. Wait a second. Your first book was 61 days, not 61 years or six years or something like that, yeah. which is pretty typical. So, because I set a standard. I, I, okay. My standard was I need a thousand words a day. Wow. And sometimes I didn't meet it. And this was me writing full time. I sat down at the computer for as long as it would take to get a thousand words. And sometimes I'd spend eight or 10 hours and I never got there. So uh, because I didn't know what I was doing, I was doing a lot of researching. Okay, how does this work? How does this uh, check out? And, and then all of a sudden it started to click. And also I'm a big fan of practice. I, I've played golf my entire life. I played golf for two years before I actually played my first round. In my very first round of golf, I shot a 93 wow. because I had hit tens of thousands of golf balls before I actually stepped out on the first tee. Wow. Okay. And so is that for your, for your writing? So you did this first book, right? hundred thousand words in two months. Yeah. What did you do with it? What, what, what were the options at the time? Where did you go? The first thing I did was I sat on it for a month and I wrote another book. The second book took me 28 <clears throat> days. But it was only 60,000 words, but it took me 28 days right. and it was a different genre. So I wanted to uh, forget about that first book before going back to it and self-editing. And then I went through it. I read it probably 20 times as I self-edited it. I could never get it exactly right. And finally, I was fed up and I said, just time to hit publish. So I dropped it on Amazon. I did a cover in PowerPoint and, uh, and, and hit publish. Uh, my dad bought, I think, 50 out of the first 53 copies that I sold. <laughs> But, but what it did was it was the timing. A traditional publisher was getting out of zombie post-apocalyptic fiction okay. into straight post-apocalyptic survival, and they wanted books, and they wanted them right now. And I said, hey, I've got a book that I'm willing to uh, let you read. And I sent it to them, and they said, well, you need, to, you need to change the cover, and you need to change the title, and you need to have it edited, but it's a good story. So right. I sent my uh, uh, solicitation letter was a simple email. They liked the story. They bought it, and uh, it has uh, and, and published it. So that first book is now a a four book series, End Times Alaska, with uh, Permuted Press. So it's a, an imprint of Simon and Schuster. So yes, wow. uh, you can find that book in, and that was my very first book that I ever wrote. And that's still available through traditional publishing. So uh, it was doing well. So the rights never reverted back to you. It's still available. Well, no, no, we still have plenty of sales. Audiobook is just killing it, or or was. Uh, six months, eight months ago. Okay. Wow. So you successful in traditional publishing already, uh, even though you'd tried self-publishing um, or indie publishing, as we prefer to call it. Um, 
What next? So the, the, this book's out uh, doing well. What were the next steps? Well, that book didn't do well until for six more months because when you turned it over to a traditional publisher, now their processes, it, it took two months to get that first book edited right? and three months for the second. So they their process then really stretched things out. In the meantime, I was doing what I loved, which is writing stories. So by the time that book hit the bestseller list in August uh, of 2016, a while ago, um, I had already published six books in another series, my free trader series, which is my flagship series. That's the one that's actually leading all my sales. Right. So that means then that when that book hit and it got some push, obviously, from Simon and Schuster, that the people who discovered it went, whoa, love this guy. And they found uh, the mother load. They found more books from you in a different series so they could keep, that's right. keep enjoying it. That was probably part of what worked really, really well, I imagine. Yes. The secondary sales and a read through, and that's having a big backlist. You never know what's going to resonate with the readers, but once you get a reader on board, they'll know your style, they'll embrace their style. And uh, yeah, a new reader to me is worth $150, even if they just have a KU membership. Really? Oh, I guess because of the page reads, right? If they read through all of yeah. your books, then that equals. And and I love you do some really good math in uh, in the release strategies, talking about that difference between the sale and the and the page reads that you would get in Kindle Unlimited, and how that sort of how you consider that the way that that would translate as a like a sale that that amount of income per book, I guess. It, that suggests to me uh, your background in consulting, et cetera, business uh, that you you do apply that sort of thing in your in your author uh, business, right? Like you 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 measure things very specifically. I do. I I have spreadsheets for everything in in my uh, business consulting. I was a, an Excel power user, okay. so I'm able to convert stuff and, and manipulate things and, uh, and show myself the data in the ways that help me make decisions. I mean, you can show data in all kinds of ways, but if it doesn't lead to a decision of do something or don't do something, then why are you tracking it? And this okay. is one of the things I did with companies, uh, uh, with Fortune 500 companies, was look at their, their measurables. Are you measuring the right things and then are you taking the right actions when you see changes? Okay. All right. That's cool. So speaking of seeing changes, at what point in your writing career did you realize, I know you had already retired and were writing full time, so it wasn't that you were leaving a career, but at what point did you say, wait a second, this is a viable full time income for me? That was uh, about 11 months after I published my first book. I had enough I had enough money on hand that it was no big deal. I, uh, I always say dress for the job you want. So I was advertising heavily. I bought the best covers I could buy. Uh, and at that point, I put a, uh, I had an editor that I put on salary. So wow. And that was important because then, now the timing, amateurs talk tactics, right? The logistics is she was ready. So whenever I dropped a book, I, I got instant service. So I never set, I never had a book more than a week with an editor. Wow. Which is, which is a major thing. I mean, some of the editors I work with, there's six month waiting lists for yeah. them. So, yeah. wow. So early on you put an editor on salary and that way uh, she was available when you needed it at the speed right. you needed it. Wow. That is amazing. That, that's quite a bit of foresight and, and also investment, right? Cause you had to invest that up front with yes. the, understanding based on the measures you've done and, and what you were um, analyzing that, that, that would pay off. I, I paid her at the beginning of the month for a hundred thousand words every single month. And I knew I could deliver. So wow. we, uh, we continued that relationship for two years until she couldn't do it anymore because of other things going on in her life. And wow. then I moved to somebody else with the same, with the same kind of program. I can imagine as a freelance, I'm just trying to picture this from the freelance editor's perspective. Again, as, as, as somebody who's, who, who does freelance work as well. Um, wow. <laughs> it's like, hey, it's a steady, steady guaranteed income, not, oh, gee, I don't have a client next month. Yeah. Uh, that's, that must have been amazing for her. So that, that, would, that relationship between the two of you uh, must have been pretty, pretty phenomenal, I guess. So let's now go to... 20 books to 50 K and uh, you and Michael Onderlay. And basically uh, I kind of know the origin, but I'm not sure my listeners are familiar with it. And specifically I want to talk about the, uh, your baby in this, which is the conferences, the gathering together of writers. 
So 20 books to 50 K was uh, Michael Anderley's brainchild. He was in Cabo San Lucas and he was looking at his book sales. The first three books, and he was making seven fifty on each one in a day. So he's making what? 25 bucks on three books in a day. We look at that now and say, Oh my God. <clears throat> but he did the math and said, if I have 20 books, each of them earning seven fifty a day, that's 50 grand a year. And for 50 grand, for 35 grand in Cabo San Lucas, I can live pretty comfortably. 50 grand, it's gravy. And so that was the simple math, 20 books to 50K as a, a, an annual income. Well, he broached some of his ideas on, on K boards and was shouted down and, and uh, vilified. And it, 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 just uh, some people are, are out of control. And so that's one of the reasons why 20 books to 50K, the Facebook group, we do keep the, the thumb screws fairly tight yep. so we don't get out of control. So uh, people don't make ad hominem and tax and things like that. Uh, so Michael formed this Facebook group and said, Hey, I'll just, I'll do my own thing. I don't, I don't need you guys. And uh, I was one of the first 50 people that came over because I, uh, I had run some things by uh, keyboards as well and did, got less than stellar feedback. Like uh, you shouldn't be writing at all kind of feedback. <clears throat> which I'm glad I didn't listen to that because I'm, I'm doing okay. And my fans, uh, my fans uh, want me to keep writing. They don't want me to die. <laughs> I guess that's, a, we'll call that a victory. <clears throat> um, so, so 20 bucks of 50 K as a Facebook group, it was going and growing and growing. And we shared some great stories and people were learning and sharing and test bedding. And uh, so we learned some things not to do. And it was great because we didn't have to make all the mistakes. Uh, people would make some and people would have some victories and we would leverage and try to do better. And everybody was going up the mountain of success differently. And, and that made it okay. No matter which way you went, you could share something and somebody isn't going to mirror your stuff and then st uh, trample you as they head up over your back. <clears throat> and then we've talked about, we would get more out of this in a face to face. So what do you think of a conference? We ran a poll and people said, hey, yeah, let's uh, do a conference. So I set up the first conference for 150 people for uh, 2017. And I know you showed up and you were one of the 400 people who came <laughs> because uh, the, the 150 person conference that became uh, uh, more and more popular last year was uh, uh, 720. This year's 1,000 and then next year's 1,500. Uh, wow. And 1,000. I've got 500 people on a wait list and it's doggy dog to get, uh, to get in there. Oh, I know. <laughs> so, Speaking uh, of yeah, someone who isn't, is, isn't on the list. <laughs> oh my God. We, we could, we could seat 1500 this year. We wow. have an all-star cast of, uh, of guests and guest speakers. And, uh, I was talking to somebody, I'm going to name drop Todd McCaffrey, uh, yesterday. And, uh, and he said, Hey, I, I live in Vegas now. Can I come to the show? And I said, of course you can as my, as my guest. Of course. Because, uh, I mean, I just I want to talk to him, shake his hand. And just like Kevin J. Anderson and, and Mark Dawson and, and the people who help so much, like yourself, uh, you have done so much for indie authors, uh, Dan Wood. And there's so many out there who, even if it's their job, but you still do more than you have to, like draft a digital, you offer the uh, formatting process. People will come over there and format their books and have no intention of ever going wide. And you're perfectly good with that. You don't make anybody try to make anyone feel bad. And these are the things that good people do. So we have no problem. Come on in. Hey, uh, draft a digital if you want to go wide. 15%, but look at what they can do for you. Um, uh, so, and, and we don't allow any sponsors because we don't want to show favoritism. We, right. we want to show favoritism to its people that we know who provide good services, good customer support, and take care of indies. Or help right. indies take care of themselves, which is the big thing that I push too. Uh, if you want to be carried, this isn't this isn't a business for you. Right. Uh, if you're willing to learn some of the hard things, you don't have to love them. You just have to learn them, like marketing and uh, and uh, like doing a newsletter. You just have to learn them, and you realize that the payoff is huge. Learning some of those little things. Well, I want to go back to the the the, the talking about the conference. There's no sponsorships. The cost to attend is incredibly ridiculously low considering the value that you get. And, and that's something I admire so much about what you do with the conference and what Michael does as well with the, the you know, the 20 books uh, brand, the way the two of you have shepherded this whole movement of giving and paying forward. Um, that, that seems to be embedded in, in the very DNA uh, of what, what it is uh, that you do. And I mean, 
I'm curious to see as it's, it's, it becomes 1500 people and more um, because unfortunately, as the more people you bring in, it causes conflict. It's like when you, when you only sell your book to one person and the ideal reader, you get a five-star review, but if enough people read it, you get the wrong person reading it and you get a one-star review. So is there a possibility that as you continue to grow, that, um, that, that family becomes a little bit more chaotic and uncontrollable is, <laughs> I mean, it probably has happened and why you've had to tighten the screws down on, on the Facebook group. I imagine. I think because we, the energy we found at, uh, at the last two conferences, the last one, 700 people, and you saw the energy, you saw the positivity, you saw the, uh, uh, the way people treated each other. And that's, I, when you lead from the front, and as Michael and I both try to exemplify what we do, uh, this is a not-for-profit. This is a reaching a hand back and helping uh, the other people. And we make the majority of our money off our fiction. So I want to sell my, my science fiction books. I want to sell my uh, post-apocalyptic book. I want to sell those books. I write the nonfiction just to help myself uh, save, save me time in the group. Because, right. hey, uh, uh, I answered the questions in Successful Indie Author. I answer those questions a hundred times and I'm like, I'm tired of writing them down. So now we just say, Hey, buy the book, five bucks. You save Craig a lot of time and all the answers are right there for you. Right. So, so that's uh, that's why the nonfiction and the nonfiction does well because of the exclusive access to the group. Right. So I turn that money around. And so whenever we have a lunch and Michael and I pay for it and I, I pay for it mostly because I uh, uh, use the revenue from the books. Okay. And, when it, when it grows to 1500, will it still feel like a family? Yes. Because of those people who have come the years before and then they take leadership roles of just by, just by uh, acting the right way, being the positive person saying, Hey, let's, uh, let's talk about urban fantasy. You're not stealing from me. You're just, uh, we're just talking. Oh, wow. That's cool. So let's, uh, let's get into the books because we've been teasing people long enough. Um, now, I recently uh, got them both and started reading the uh, successful indie author release strategies. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the thing that uh, appealed to me uh, when I saw it, because I'm not a fast writer, is that even on the back of the book, it says, uh, do you publish one book a year or 20? Here's a secret. You can be successful with either. Publish your books in a way that brings you the most readers. And I love that you focus on that and, and, and the way you talk about different people going up the mountain in, in different ways. Um, what's important then? Uh, if, if, if the volume of books isn't important, what is important in a release strategy? Managing reader expectations. If you release one book a year, you just have to make sure that when you get that reader, and it's even more important than uh, if I release every month, people will see my stuff. But if you release once a year, they'll see your stuff and then you'll never see them again. They'll never see that author, even if they're consistent in publishing one a year, because there's nobody to tell them that that new book is out. So if you publish just one book a year, you you really have to drive, please join my newsletter. Please uh, 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 subscribe to my blog, my Patreon, something that keeps them attached to you. Also, if you publish one book a year, something you need to take more into uh, uh, more to heart is marketing and advertising, especially if you want to make uh, full-time money. It's right. easier to sell 10 books to one person than one book to 10 people. And that's what you're trying to do. So you just simply have to shift that dynamic. If you're writing one book a year, you have to spend a lot of time then now learning advertising and marketing to get that one book in front of all these new readers. Okay. And prior to a book's actual release date then, what are the things, like maybe one of, one, of, one of the two top things that an author needs to really seriously consider uh, for setting that date, maybe meeting that date? I mean, are, are, there, you, are there checklists? How, how, does that, how does that happen? I, I did put a couple checklists uh, with countdowns in the book, and those are, those are very general. The big thing you want to do is you want to build interest in the book. Uh, if you're publishing fast, then you don't have time to do that. So actually, it, it works better if you're publishing like once a quarter. As soon as you finish the one book, you have some follow-ups, but then you're, you're setting up that next book. And that's through snippets, hey, little caricatures, uh, get some fan art of a character and show those and share that. So even if you don't publish a book, you still want to send your newsletter to everybody and keep them engaged. Hey, here's what's going on in my life. It's, it's snowing again. It's raining again, whatever, whatever it might be. 
uh, share share a picture of yourself doing something uh, interesting um, or not, <laughs> but still keep the readers engaged and manage their expectations. So one thing I did early on was I, I calculated exactly, here's exactly when I'm going to release these books. Even if I haven't started writing it yet, I knew exactly when I would be done. And I always met those dates. I was never late. And uh, that's, that's important. And now I don't actually do a publication date because I, I'm more fluid. I have less time to write now that I'm a full-time writer. I actually write part-time. I do full-time conferencing. This year's four conferences. So uh, that was uh, more than full-time. And then, oh, by the way, I write on the side. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm releasing a book every of my own that I've written like every six weeks, eight weeks. Okay. And, uh, and I just set those up as soon as I have fidelity on when that release date is. I don't do a pre-order because I don't want to put that kind of pressure on myself. Right. Even though I'll still hit my date. I, but I want, I want the editor to know here's when it's coming. I want my cover done ahead of time. Uh, I want my, uh, my formatter. I, I, I farm all that stuff out because, right. and that's, uh, it's, it's, they do a better job than me. And I really want, I always want to put out professional books. Right. And that's, uh, it's important because some indie authors, uh, some people like saying indie authors put out crap and I don't, I'm not a fan of that. And so I definitely don't want to exemplify that. I want people right. to see here's a top notch product. Always. Here's one with one or two typos, maybe in a full length book. Right. Although, I mean, I've been a bookseller since the early nineties and not a single book gets published without a typo in it, whether it's the world's biggest publisher or you know, the yeah. world's smallest indie author. Um, but I, I think what's important, what, you, what you're saying there is that your time is better spent on the creative, uh, on the writing. You've got the professionals, you've got the right editors in place, you've got the right designers, formatters, because then you can very easily focus on, you, you mentioned that thousand words a day early on or whatever it happens to be. And obviously you have to divide your time up with the group and the, and the community and obviously the conferences. Yeah. Cause you just got back from overseas as I understand it. Yes. Edinburgh. We did a seven day uh, conference there, uh, five days of writing retreat and two days of actual conference. And that went exceptionally well, uh, much better than I, I thought it would, especially since I was sick. That's why I thought it wouldn't go well. I, I didn't think I couldn't give it my full attention, Right. but people were engaged and they came there. They knew what they wanted to accomplish and the writing retreat part was really uh, above and beyond my expectations. Right. We got together. There were people who got 10,000 words in a day who said at home, I can get 2,000. It just, wow. I mean, amazing production and quality production because they shared. We had seven editors walking around and that they could say, hey, could you come take a look at this last paragraph I wrote? Was seven editors were there as well? Wow. That's, that's quite a, <laughs> this must have been a much smaller group, obviously, than Vegas. We had uh, 200 on the conference days and about 120 for the writing retreat. So it was very, very intimate in yeah. that regard. We didn't have a single group with more than about 25 group, meaning a genre like right. romance. We had 25 sci-fi. We had about 20. Cool. Did you, did you get any writing done or were you just too busy being an, an, an admin to everything? I, I did some, I did an awful lot of editing. I, I have two new nonfiction coming out collaborations and uh, write compelling fiction that I'm co-writing with Larry Martin. He wrote the original version and I'm adding in science fiction and also updating it for self-publishing because okay. his focus was on selling to legacy publishers. So those books will come out under the uh, successful indie author series brand. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. So, I mean, I have the first two books in the series. That means I can get the next one. And the they'll all match. Two, yes. Yeah, the next two in the series. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to make them all glossy cover next <laughs> Now, back to your fiction. Uh, you talk about um, writing to market, and, and you show a beautiful Venn diagram of the things you're most passionate about, the stories you want to tell and need to tell, and the stories that will sell and that there's a market for. And somewhere in that middle is that sweet spot. Um, how has that served you? Because you write in more than one genre. Like, how do you, uh, does, does that, obviously that changes what you're passionate about now versus, you know, uh, next next six months or something like that? It, it is. Uh, Michael Anderley and I spent a lot of time together in Edinburgh talking about what the next series will be as I have, uh, uh, geez, like three or four series wrapping up. Right. What's going to be the next one? What's going to be the next big, big one for me? That one, I can, I can write passionately but is in a, in a market that 
uh, he is having wild success in. So look for a, a paranormal space opera <laughs> coming in 2020. Because that oh. space opera is just what I love. I, I, I just, I love writing it. Awesome. All right. So now that we've teased people with these great nonfiction books, the great fiction books that you have out and are coming, where can people find out more about you and learn, learn about everything about Craig Martell, your writing and uh, 20 books uh, conferences? Well, uh, CraigMartell.com, C-R-A-I-G-M-A-R-T-E-L-L-E.com. And for 20 books to 50K, that's the 20 books to 50K registered uh, Facebook group. That uh, and that's where we that's where we are. It's it's Facebook, and that's where thirty two thousand, almost thirty three thousand members now. Wow. Well, Craig, on behalf of authors everywhere, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time because the more time that you put into helping other authors, that takes away from your passion for writing. Uh, obviously, you're passionate about helping people, but I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you do for the indie author community. And I'm sure you can hear the echo of my listeners going, oh, yes, Craig, thank you so much. Well, no, thank you, Mark, for what you do and what draft to digital uh, does for the, for the authors out there, all the self-published, making things possible. Just like Amazon. I mean, people will vilify Amazon on occasion and take shots at them. But you know what? Uh, Amazon has made this all possible for us. And they have sent me some huge, huge checks. And I'm very thankful for them. So, so thank you. Amazon's bringing eight people to the conference in November. Wow. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's great. Cause the, the, well, if they were there last year, I didn't see any of the ones that I recognized. There was one person. Yeah. They were going to bring three, but they uh, uh, bagged out at the last minute, but this right. year eight with uh, audible uh, KDP print um, KDP overall. Oh, is it Steve from audible who's coming. I do not know. Okay. I do not know who from Audible is coming, but Audible will be there. Awesome. A podium will be there. Tantor, Find Away Voices. I don't think Dreamscape is sending anybody. So we're going to have a huge audio presence there. That's going to be amazing. Well, uh, I look forward to that. And for all the writers who are lucky enough to be either in or close enough to the shortlist, <laughs> if some people can't make it, it's going to be an amazing one. But I'm sure if you're part of the Facebook group, you can kind of follow along and get a bit of a hint. Because last year, uh, as I remember, you were live streaming to the Facebook group mm -hmm. for, for many of the events, right? And, and last year we live streamed the main room only and we caught a couple other videos. But this year we, we are live streaming all three of the, the main conference rooms, the Samsung Live, which has 850 seats in it, and then the other two. So we're live streaming all of the presentations and panels. Some of the small breakout groups we are not, but uh, right. we're going to have, we put it into SCED and we have 79 sessions. Wow. that people can pick from. Wow. Excellent. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer because I know there's writing and editing you have to get back to and probably planning as well. Thanks, Greg, so much for your time. Thank you, Mark. We're glad to be on. There's so much that Craig said that inspired me in so many different ways, but I want to kind of go back to him talking about Dungeons and Dragons I know it's going to be a bit of an aside, but hey, this is my podcast, so it's my reflection. And when I was re-listening back to that, I was thinking about Dungeons and & Dragons and, oh, how I used to play that. It was, it was around the same era, and I loved creating adventures and, 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 and hanging out with uh, different people. I, I played with a few different groups. Uh, my, my buddy uh, Tom Potts uh, introduced me to Dungeons & Dragons, and I had the Monster Manual, and I had a Player's Handbook and a Dungeon Master's Guide. And I still have the, the dice, and I still have some of the figures uh, from those days. And I remember we would go to someone's basement uh, on a Sunday afternoon, or maybe Sunday, like, you know, 10 or 11 a.m., and we'd have lunch there, and we'd be, we'd be there for five or six hours. Or, or my buddy Greg Roberts, we would play in his basement, and sometimes we would play uh, after dinner and, and play until one or two in the morning uh, with different people. And uh, even even just playing one on one, I remember there was a time I actually played Dungeons and Dragons uh, in in one of our classrooms. We actually uh, were supposed to be studying, and we were quietly passing notes and playing. <laughs> so it was so much creativity involved in that. And 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 as I said, I loved creating adventures and and these these new worlds and realms and backgrounds and stories and 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 characters that uh, people would interact with. And I loved creating these adventures for my friends to go on. And in particular related to Dungeons and Dragons, that really was a fuel for me 
for the very first novel I ever wrote, because it was derived from D&D adventures uh, that my buddy Tom and I did. Now, the, the very first novel I ever wrote was called The Story of Aaron Bach. Now, Bach, funnily enough, was BOC, Blue Oyster Cult, uh, a band that Tom loved. And so when he was naming this character, he always used stuff like that in it. Uh, my dear friend, Tom Potts, this, this is this barbarian character. Uh, he, the character was actually named Conan Bach, you know, obviously after Conan the Barbarian. But I knew very well that I couldn't use that. Even back then, I knew it was a violation of copy, copyright, uh, trademark, etc., because we enjoyed reading the Conan the Barbarian um, the comic books as well as the oversized uh, graphic uh, novel comic books, which were a lot more violent and had a lot more sex and, and uh, naked women in it and stuff like that, which, you know, 14-year-old boys, right? Now, the novel, the story of Aaron Bach, was filled with violence and, and fighting and epic clashes and swearing and plenty of sex. I mean, come on, I was 14 years old. I was, I was young. I was hopped up on sugar and on life. And I was a horny 14-year-old kid. And so, so many of those fantasies worked their way into my writing back then. I was most certainly a nerd. And uh, I was most at home in front of a blank page with a pen or a typewriter. And even prior to writing out long form, I used to do lots of uh, sketches and, and stick figure comics and stuff like that. Now, I wrote the um, the story of Aaron Bach, and it clocked in at perhaps 25,000, 30,000 words. And then the following summer, I worked on the sequel. Now, spoiler alert, because these are horrible novels, absolutely terribly written novels, and terribly conceived too, uh, but I'll get to the point of that in a minute. Now, uh, spoiler alert, as Aaron Bach dies at the end of, of this book, and it's he's believed to be dead, I should say, when he sacrifices himself to save his best friend at the end of the first novel. And, and I remember, I was, I was reading so much on writing, and I was looking at themes in literature, and, and I actually took the, the pride goeth before the fall, quite literally, and actually had him fall, not just the fall of his character, but the fall, and it was just sort of a weird misunderstanding that I had back then. But I had uh, Aaron plummet over a cliff supposedly to his death on the rocky waters below uh, in that novel's final scene. And so the sequel, The Search for Aaron Bach, you know, is the tale of his best friend Thundar Hunt. Yeah, and I, I know Thundar, I had to change the spelling of it from that cartoon character on TV. But Thundar learns uh, six years later that his friend is still alive and being held captive uh, by somebody he had encountered or wronged previously uh, out of revenge. Now, this uh, sequel has uh, a bit less sex, but plenty of adventure and uh, and uh, additional secondary characters. And, and, and I spent uh, another whole summer uh, drawing out pictures to go with the book and then, and then working on that book. Now, I actually did uh, a comic book version um, of the first book, The Story of Aaron Bach, which I think the comic itself was the story of Conan Bach. And then when I wanted to seriously turn it into a manuscript is when I changed it to Aaron Bach. But it was cute how, uh, when I look back on it, because I, I still do have it, um, that some of my chapters were like one single spaced page. And I thought, wow, this is a long chapter. Now, my writing was, was pretty simple back then. I mean, I recently read a book that uh, I know an indie author uh, recently published and which has sold a ton and, and done really, really well. And I remember thinking when I was reading it that that I wrote better in grade six or that my, my shitty, you know, 14-year-old horny fantasy novel um, w w when I was 14 that I hammered out on a typewriter w was either on par or, or better than it. And, and, and it, it was actually pretty crappy, but... I suppose that's one good thing about when I grew up in writing, because I didn't really have the option, and there were gatekeepers to prevent this horrible book from getting out there. Now, now this guy has gone on to become a very skilled writer. Now, he, he had put his first work out straight to Kindle and other catalogs. Now, I didn't have that option. Mine went into a drawer. And, and that's one of the interesting things that I think of, is that my early work that wasn't ready for prime time stayed there and will never see the light of day. Unfortunately, so many authors today let that first work get out there, and uh, and and that can be a thing that can be damaging. Although, even even if you get better, I'm I'm the kind of person to to know how far a writer has to progress in their journey. So I uh, I kind of forgive those lapses because I understand that a writer needs to grow. But that's that's an interesting thing. I had that benefit. Uh, that nobody ever saw that. Well, I mean, except really for for this one person. So. 
the first young woman who ever truly won my heart. Someone I, I shared a passion for writing with at a really young age, so around that age of 14, 15. She was a brilliantly creative and gifted person, and, and, and I shared so much of my early writing with her. This was kind of the first time I'd actually really opened my heart or opened my writing uh, to, to someone else who who didn't knock me down, who actually respected me and appreciated me for who I was and what I was writing. Now, she was an incredible force in helping me realize my passion for writing and for storytelling and, and that it was something that I could pursue, that I could actually do. She listened to me, she knew me, and she championed my writing. And she made an incredible difference to me, one that she'll likely never truly know. And we're still friends uh, to this day. After these many, many decades, even though we live far apart from one another, we still sort of stay in touch. But in fact, uh, she actually still has some of the original horrible type written manuscript pages from that just absolutely atrocious novel that I wrote. And, and, a, and a few times she's jokingly threatened to release it to the world. Now, I know she wouldn't. Uh, and even though our paths went in different directions, uh, when I think back uh, about her, and I think back to her and, and, and to me, and I remember that incredible positive influence that she had on me in my own path to wanting to be a writer. It's why I dedicated my novel, I, Death, to her, because she really made that significant difference. Uh, and, and I think in many writers' lives, there's that person who may not have realized they made that difference. And, uh, and you know, thinking about Dungeons and Dragons and this horrible first novel from Craig really made me think that. Now, the reason I brought up the first novel that I wrote is that, like like myself and, and the indie author I talked about who put that first book out, our paths were, were different than Craig's. Now, he wrote his first novel later in life, um, you know, dedicated, committed to the craft and as a, a, you know, a business approach. And he sold that first novel to a publisher. Now, I cut my chops and I, I learned dedication while working on my first novel not in the same way that Craig did because uh, I wasn't yet skilled enough uh, at it and it was sort of my first go at, at seriously writing a long project so it was summer I was 14 years old and off for school vacation my, I remember my friends were being out on their bikes and going swimming and playing tag and and doing all the fun summer things that I wanted to do but there I was in the basement of my parents house in, in, a, in sort of a, at a kitchen table in front of a, my mom's old Underwood typewriter, madly pounding the words onto the page and, and creating what I felt back then was a truly original epic adventure. My friends would knock on the door and say, hey, you coming out? Are you going to join us here? Are you going to join us there? And I remember the difficulty of, of looking at that fun I could have with them and then looking at what I wanted to do and the dreams I had of being a writer and actually sitting down and doing the writing. It's, it's embarrassing to look back on the work, and I joke about how crappy uh, my novel was and, and the ideas, but, but I'm not at all ashamed that I did it. I'm glad that I did it. It not only helped start me off on the path to be beginning to keep working at my craft, but it also taught me the importance of, of dedication and commitment in prioritizing writing, even when it was really, really hard. And that's something that Craig reminds me of and his approach is it is really really hard but is this something you want to do he's working 12 14 hour days and he's getting solid writing done and I find that inspiring I look at Craig and I'm inspired and I even look at that 14 year old me who is wise in so many ways wiser than I am to this day and I look back fondly at that skinny nerd and I send him my love and my respect so thank you, Craig, for reminding me of the things that I owe that young and hopeful kid who is worried about acne, wondering if he might ever actually be able to be a writer. I mean, wondering if he might ever actually have sex, wondering about all the possibilities. And I respect so much of what that 14-year-old kid still teaches me and inspires in me to this day. And speaking of owing... I owe you, the listener, info on how you can win a copy of Craig's book, Successful Indie Author Release Strategies. There will be a total of four copies available. Now, two copies will be randomly drawn from anyone who leaves a comment on episode 90 of this podcast over at starkreflections.ca. And two other copies will be randomly drawn from the patrons for this show. 
And so the draw will be uh, taking place on September 2nd. So you've got until the end of day uh, Eastern Time, September 1st, 2019, to leave your comment. And the winners will be announced in that week's episode. Well, that's it for episode 90 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful conversation with Craig. I hope you didn't mind the little divergent reflection I took after the interview. Thanks so much for hanging out with me this week on the Stark Reflections podcast. And so, until next week in episode 91, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.